So, ophthalmology. Um, again, it's a pretty long, it's a pretty big topic, and there's quite a lot to it. Um, can't, I can't see the chat anymore. Sorry, guys, one second. Do you know how to make it so I can see the chat? Oh, Meg, I can see you. <laughs> um, okay, if you have any questions, you're going to have to, like, I'll, I'll try and work out how to, oh, here we go. Sorry, I'm really bad at technology. It's a, it's a thing. Okay, so ophthalmology, really big topic, but I think a really important topic. Um, if you think about it, it's one of the only topics in fourth year that you've had a whole day worth of teaching on in third year as CCT, and you've had an entire CBL on it as well. So I think it's definitely worth focusing on it and, and making sure you, under, you understand the concepts. Um, because it is quite an important thing. And I know in particularly in other years, they've had quite a lot of top questions about um, ophthalmology and particularly in regards to kind of acute presentation. So make sure that you're really comfortable with differentiating between the two of them. Which hopefully you will be after this. So I like to take things systematically. Um, I'm a really big believer in, if you, can't under if you can't explain it to somebody else, then you don't understand it. Um, and so, the best way to make sure you've covered all those bases to explain to somebody else is by just taking it in that systematic approach. So what causes it? What is it? Um, symptoms, investigations, diagnosis, including differentials, um, treatment, management, and then complications. And that's literally just like one line about everything. You don't need to go into the, you know, the minutiae of it all because quite frankly, there's quite a lot of um, topics in ophthalmology. Does that make sense? So, again as well, if you were here last week, I'm a big believer in working smart rather than necessarily working hard. Obviously you need to do both, but in finals there's just so many topics um, and I think it can feel quite overwhelming. But if you just break it down and try and think about what you're learning. So at each point with a condition, I'd ask myself, what are the buzzwords? Um, so what are the kind of key things that um, an examiner would want to convey in a question? Um, so for example, glaucoma, if they said like a hard red eye, that would be that buzzword. Um, and then also looking at an OSCE link. So almost obviously OSCE is a huge part of fourth year. I know, I know yours is different. I'm not really sure what is happening with your OSCE, um, but it's still worth thinking about. So could this be an OSCE station and what would it be? Again, it's, it's kind of easy to do a respiratory exam, but being able to explain to somebody what COPD is or explain to somebody what glaucoma is is a bit more difficult and something that I definitely neglect um, so if you're also someone who does might be worth thinking about that and then linking it to other conditions so particularly in the eye there's quite a lot of link links between things and um, often one condition can cause the next so being aware of that and understanding the kind of progression I think is really important too so I talked last week a bit a bit about my approach to investigations. It's a bit different in the eye because obviously you're focusing on just one bit and whilst the eye can get can um, be affected like by systemic disease, um, actually often when it comes to like your approach to investigating the eye, starting with a cardio exam or doing a chest x-ray is probably not going to be that smart. Um, so instead take an approach called afros so that's looking at acuity so that's your Snellen chart um, and basically just seeing how good their actual general vision is um, looking at the fields so seeing when you do the visual fields and you cover your eye I'm sure you guys all know it. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna patronize you with that one um, reflexes so that's pupil pupillary reflexes but also accommodation um, and then the red reflex which links into the next bit which is ophthalmoscopy um, or fundoscopy I'll probably use those words interchangeably um, but essentially taking the kind of ophthalmoscope and looking directly into someone's eye and visualizing the retina and the back of the eye and then all the weird and wonderful special tests which we'll talk about in more detail um, how does that sound does, does that all kind of fit in with what you were thinking or what you know going in sorry I'm still kind of getting used to um, talking to myself it's a bit weird um, and I do normally love talking so right so we're gonna have a quick look at um, anatomy um, just really briefly because I think that 
it's one of those things if you can't understand and visualize the eye it makes understanding how conditions work a bit more difficult so we'll come back to this one actually here is the eye so we have there's three layers in the eye you have if everyone can see the mouse there's the three layers here one two and three so the first layer is that really um a vascular kind of connective tissue and that's the cornea and the, and the sclera that make it up so they're kind of the same thing the sclera is more peripheral and it's white whereas the cornea is right at the front here and it's clear and essentially the difference between them is the reason it's clear at the cornea is because it means that only light light can only be transmitted from the cornea through the eye rather than getting light coming all the way through so again so the sclera is here and that's white and then you've got the like transparent cornea which light can pass through and again that's his main structure his main function is to kind of permit light through but it also provides some integrity to the eye and some shape because otherwise the eye is basically just a ball of jelly it's a bit gross um that's another thing it, this this has some kind of gross pictures in so if you're squeamish feel free to like close your eyes or something listen to my dulcet tones um without the screen cast on okay then the next layer is the choroid um which can so you've got technically it's the uvea which is the choroid the ciliary body and the iris um the choroid itself is this really vascular um tissue and that gives all the blood and the, and the nutrient supply to the eye um in particular it also has a black pigment in it and the point of that is obviously light passes through from here and then the choroid which is around here basically prevents the light from reflecting back and causing scattering of light so you've got the light coming through and then being stopped by the dark pigment pigment of the choroid there okay and then we have obviously the ciliary body that's the kind of muscle it's um involuntary muscle that attaches to the um pupil and basically to the iris sorry and and helps contraction of the muscle um so that when that we have too much or too little light we can contract and relax muscle and basically control the amount of light going through it also makes our aqueous humor which we'll come on to later with glaucoma um, and then essentially we have the iris which is the actual colored muscle so you've got circular and radial rings of muscle in the iris the circular muscle being circular um, and it contracts when there's bright light and basically tightens the um increases the size of the well, decreases the size of the pupil um, and reduces the amount of light that goes through hold on a second i have a question is there any refraction by the cornea well i'm glad you asked anonymous and um, we'll come on to this in a minute but there is essentially the cornea and the lens both do some refraction okay pupil as we all know is the hole in the iris that light passes through um what else is there to say then we've got the kind of posterior cavity here um, and that's filled with the vitreous humor, which is like jelly-like substance, and it helps um, focus the light onto the back of the eye into our third layer, which is the retina, and that contains all the sensory tissue, so the photoreceptors, which are your rods and your cones, and it also has the, um, how do I describe this? It's, um, it's the area where all the actual kind of, where light is directed onto, particularly um, at the back, you have the macula and the fovea. So that's the area of really high density photoreceptors. Um, and light is transmitted onto that, makes the picture that's then transmitted from those photoreceptors through the optic nerve. That's a very kind of brief description of it, but does that make sense to everybody? So if I show you here, same thing again, we've got all these weird and wonderful bits to the eye essentially got the three layers as always light comes through the transparent cornea is reflected down it's um, refracted and then focused onto the um, macula um, and then you have the light response so the photoreceptors in the retina take the light it's passed down the bipolar neurons so they just work both ways and then the actual ganglion cells of the nerves pass it through the optic nerve into the thalamus in the brain um, this is just emphasizing so we also have our anterior and our posterior chambers so before like we said um, you have your ciliary body you have the actual iris and then you have this little chamber here which is kind of the bit between the iris and the um, like cornea or the so it's in the um, 
what they call a radio corneal angle and that's the kind of chamber the posterior chamber which is there sorry and then you have your anterior chamber at the front bit here and that's between the cornea and the lens so anterior chamber and then posterior chamber which is this really narrow bit between the iris and the cornea um, and then the ciliary body is, is kind of makes the the bottom of the triangle there and that's that that's the bit that actually makes your aqueous humor okay so as the person asked on anonymous we have um light passing through and it's refracted both from the cornea and then also again at the lens and then focused onto the macula of the retina and this is what i was talking about with the actual rods and cones they take the information they pass it down the bipolar cells and then it goes to the ganglion cells and then passes down through the brain. That is pretty much all the anatomy we're going to do. I know that was really fast. I just wanted to kind of have a quick summary so you knew what bits are where, um, but we'll refer back to this. Does that all make sense to everyone? Is everyone okay with that? Okay, so this is the, just the last bit about the brain. Once it's actually left the eyes, so it's come through the eyes, it's been refracted, it takes a, um, it takes two there's two kind of tracks in it. Um, so that's why when you look at a, um, a picture normally, um, our eye takes in the information from both sides and it um, crosses over at the optic chiasm, which is here, um, which you find in your pituitary. Um, and then you have, it comes down here, you have your superior colliculus, which coordinates your eye movements. So for example, when you follow a ball, like that's going in the air, your, both your eyes move at the same time across. And then you have your lateral geniculate nucleus, which is in the thalamus. And essentially what it does is it takes all the information from both eyes and coordinates it to make one clear picture because the image we receive before the lateral geniculate nucleus takes in the information is upside down, it's flipped round and it's really small. So we need to actually make that into something our brains can comprehend. Okay. We aren't going to touch on visual field defects because that could be its own other lecture. But essentially, understanding the pathway is really important because then we can try and visualise where the defects are. So if it's if we have a problem here, we're cutting off all the the source of the information at both points, so we're getting complete blindness in our right eye. But again, I, I might put this in the document because it is something that's important to kind of understand. But it's just a very long topic. Okay, is everyone okay so far? Any questions? Um, I will try and make it more interactive as we go along as well. I just wanted to cover some anatomy. Okay, perfect. So, quick sidebar. This bad boy is a slit lamp. Um, there's not much to say about it other than you put your head in it and it basically focuses an actual beam of light. So it's a very specific high intensity um, beam and we you just use it to visualize the, the back of the eye even better. Um, I'm just saying it now because it comes up about 40 million times in this lecture so just say so you're aware of what it is because I wasn't until about eight months ago. Um, so here we are. Okay condition one is cataracts so does someone want to give me some like buzzwords you'd expect to hear in a question about cataracts? Just like type them in the chat. Cloudy, yes, yeah. very good. What, how about the halos, old people, elderly patient liking all of this? Yes. Starburst, yeah, very good. Diabetes, yeah, very good. This is great, you guys should run this. Um, okay, so cataracts are um, kind of an age related calcification of the lens or a pacification rather of the lens. Um, no one really knows exactly why, but there's why it happens. But um, as someone's mentioned already, there's lots of conditions implicated in it. So diabetes is a huge one. About 60% of people with diabetes will um, develop cataracts at some point in their life. So definitely something to look out for. Um, and with that, things again that are kind of linked with steroid use is, is linked to cataracts. And that's long term steroid use, not like puffing on your inhaler every now and again. So no one really knows exactly what causes them but they think it's something to do with the way that the crystallines in the lens itself um, 
as time goes on, they, they harden and they, they become less opaque in response to um, different enzymes. That's partly why, again, they think diabetes may be linked. They think that the sugar, it, that the, the high glucose rather, um, might actually deposit into the cell and, and cause um, alterations in the enzymes, but they're never gonna ask you anything to that detail. So just be aware, diabetes is a risk factor. Steroid use is a risk factor. Ophthalmology is great because as a general rule, if you've had it before, you'll have it again. And also, um, unless it's been corrected by surgery. And also if your family's got it, you've got it. So if you're ever struggling for an answer in ophthalmology and obs and gynae and pretty much every condition, if your family's got it, you've got it. Okay, so what, what's the problem with having this calcification or the opacification of the lens? Well, two things. One, less light can get through. And two, the light that gets through isn't being kind of neatly refracted back onto the macula. It's actually getting scattered across. And that causes this kind of generalized blurred picture. So if we look at this, these two young, young chaps here, um, this picture isn't, it's not that clear anyway, in my humble opinion, but here it's really blurry. Um, yeah, it's, it's not very clear. And it's kind of that widespread blurring. So they can still make out what's happening, but you couldn't say exactly who that was. Um, does that make sense? So what other kind of things might they have? So we've talked about that, the blurring. Why do they get a glare? Does anybody know? Yeah, again, the scattering of light. Well done. So um, that scattering of light, and it's particularly found at night, um, partly because our eyes are already not that great at handling night and night vision. So we have rods in our cones. Our cones are very good for color vision, just think C and C, um, but they only work in really bright light, which is why our, our color vision is worse at night. Um, our rods work in really dim light um, and they help us kind of, they provide our understanding of black and white vision. So they're very good for like the detail, um, but of kind of, you know, of images. But when you have a cataract, the rods, which are not necessarily that prominent in the macula anyway, um, are getting even less light um, because of the scattering. So that's why they get, um, so that partly explains why they get the glare and also explains a bit about, if you look at this picture here, the tinting of the, um, you see there's like a kind of yellow tint to this cataract, to, to this picture, and that's from the cataract, cataract as well and the scattering of the light. So there's not enough light going to the, um, to the cones. Okay, so we've talked a little bit, what, what other things can you get in, in cataracts? We've talked about a glare, we've talked about generalized blurring. What's a halo? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, perfect. I was so confused and that was so cryptic. Yeah, I like that. Um, so it's a circle around light. Um, and again, it's because of the scattering of the light. Okay, so as a little sidebar, we're not really covering that much pediatrics in this lecture, but I think this is a good point just to make reference to it, partly because um, congenital cataracts are actually the, the most common cause of cataracts um, worldwide. They're a really kind of unfortunate cause of morbidity and in a lot of countries, even though they could be easily corrected, it can lead to significant kind of blindness and vision impairment. And if you think about the impact that has in terms of your jobs, your profession, driving, learning to read, education, like it's such a huge aspect. So be aware of that. And also be aware therefore that with kids, they can't articulate any of this. They're not gonna be able to say, oh, I have a generalized blurring around my peripheral, and my central visual field. They're gonna, struggle to meet their milestones. So that's all of their milestones as well. They're gonna have difficulty walking because they'll be unclear about their surroundings. They're gonna struggle with smiling at six weeks because they're not gonna be able to see you. They're not gonna fix and follow, all those different things. Um, so a very common cause of, um, I say common, a very important cause of delayed milestones should be cataracts or some type of refractive error. Because again, a child isn't gonna be able to say, Oh, I think I'm short-sighted. And then they end up wearing, they just have to kind of like 
failed to meet their milestones and then they end up with those really like cute little glasses goggle things I should have put a picture in if you guys have seen them they're really cute okay the only other thing I wanted to kind of point out in cataracts before we talked about treatment was something called the second sight phenomenon um, I don't know if you've heard of it but essentially often people with cataracts don't realize that they have cataracts until kind of the later stages so obviously this man here has quite a bad cataract and just by looking at him you could tell that his lens is opacificating is that a word? but um, most of the time cataracts develop over the course of years like multiple years so before that happens often they'll present as some they'll say oh my vision's actually getting a lot better and that's actually a bad sign because what's happening is if they are already short, well, long sighted, so unable to see things at a short distance, what happens is the hardening of the lens actually increases the level of refractive, the refractive angle, and essentially the light coming through um, gets like hits at a different angle. So if they've already had a refractive error, it might slightly correct the refractive error. And that's called the second sight phenomenon because they get a kind of a new wave of sight quite literally okay so i put this long word down here does anyone know what it is or could they explain it to me or the group yeah <laughs> yeah perfect like olive yeah so it's the treatment of cataracts um as you've said so you're replacing the lens surgically so what you do is you make a little incision um in the actual periphery it's only a tiny incision like like and it looks quite big here but it's even smaller than that it'll be like i say even smaller there is no marker on here it would be mil millimeters um so and then they use a sharp um implement to widen the hole slightly and you then they put the faco tip in which is like a ultrasonic tip and it basically it breaks up the the lens and the cataract by using ultrasonic waves, so vibrates essentially, breaks it down, sucks up that old lens, and then puts in a new intraocular lens with a lens injector. It's very exciting. Um, this is a really, really kind of revolutionary um, procedure in terms of it can be done as a day case, you can do it with very limited anesthesia, um, and it has very, very good success rates, like 97%, usually re responds quite quickly, um, in terms of healing time there's very few complications if it's done right so in terms of I think in your CBL this is one of the cases and they asked about you know would you thinking about the complications in the um, of sending somebody for surgery and thinking about the implications the implications are usually quite good so you should probably just do it um, yeah any questions about cataracts before we move on Perfect, cool. So uveitis. Uveitis is, as we talked before, is inflammation of the uvea. And yeah, as we said, the uvea is the choroid, the ciliary body, and the lens. Did I make that up? And the iris, sorry, I did make that up. Um, so I, it's one of those things that I'd heard so much about, but I never really understood it in terms of like, what is anterior uveitis? I just kind of like went along with it. Same with iritis and all that. I was like, yeah, yeah, sure. So I'm going to try and explain it. Uveitis is the general word for any inflammation of the choroid, the iris, and the ciliary body. It can be anterior, it can be posterior, it can be anywhere in between. There's like all these strange names, there's like six different types or something. Anterior uveitis is the most common and it's um, inflammation of the iris or inflammation of the um, iris and ciliary body. I don't know if you've seen that kid at the spelling bee who's like aridocyclitis. But this is, this is what it is. So aridocyclitis is inflammation of the iris and the ciliary body, body. And that's just a very specific way of saying anterior uveitis. Fun fact. Um, so inflammation of the uvea, what kind of things would you be thinking in terms of what are the buzzwords in a question? Look at this, straight in. Yeah, so HLA, B27, and we've given some examples in the group. Um, photophobia, yeah, really good. So in terms, that's a really good one in terms of the actual symptoms. Um, so they get this kind of really characteristic, like 
painful red eye. And when I say red, like there's a picture here, that is red. Um, this person, it's really painful. Um, they'll be watering, so that's the lacrimation. It's, it's a very, um, and it's very inflamed, they have photophobia, um, general decreased um, or like blur, blurring vision. So that's the decreased visual acuity. And then this sluggish or irregular pupil. So if you look here, this pupil isn't exactly, a, it's not a nice circle. Um, and that's part of the inflammatory response. Um, as you guys have already said, it's often immune mediated. So that's like particularly HLA B27. So your ankylosing spondylitis, um, IBD, particularly um, osteoclitis and cry well, that's both types of IBD. Wow, finals was a long time ago. Um, SLE, rheumatic, all the others. Um, so because of that, because it's often immune based, we need immune, we need to dampen down the immune response. So we give steroids and that can be topical, intraocular or systemic, depending on how severe. Usually they try topical, so like an ointment. Um, intraocular is an injection. Um, I've seen this done and it's horrible because you have to like, they hold their head like this and they put it in. But the other person, the person having it done seemed fine. It was just me. Um, and then systemic. So that's taking a care oral tablet usually. And then um, analgesia, obviously, again, it's really painful. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen someone with like, an acute like, an anterior uveitis picture, um, but they will make it known how painful it is. They will yell. So you want to give them appropriate um, analgesia. This is um, a little table I took from a website that I've like linked in my resources bit. Um, so again, iritis and iridocyclitis is um, the two kind of the two aspects of anterior uveitis. It's often idiopathic, but there is that kind of common buzzword association between um, HLA B27 conditions, so rheumatoid arthritis, your ankylosing, IBD, blah blah blah. So. We've talked a bit about, we've got that red eye, the photophobia, blurred vision, lacrimation, and hyperpion. I think I have a picture of it in the other slide. Ooh, where's she gone? Okay, she'll come up later, I'm sure. Um, hyperpion essentially is when you get a collection of pus in the anterior chamber, and it quite literally has like a fluid level line. When you look at the eye, you can see the level of pus, which is nice. Um, diagnostics, so that slit eye lamp, slit lamp examination that we talked about before. Um, Tonometry, just to rule out um, kind of a, a glaucoma, and also just generally looking at suspected underlying conditions. So, doing a um, serotyping, looking for your rheumatoid factor, things like that, to zero down on whether this is a and kind of extra articular like response to a lot of the kind of joint MSK room conditions. So. Other types of infections then, I won't touch on this too much because I'm, I'm sure you guys are pretty down with this. Conjunctivitis, there's kind of three main types, allergic, viral, bacterial. Allergic is the one that's so annoying. It's really, really itchy, really red, um, and obviously comes and goes quite often. There'll be that history of ATP. They might have had exposure to an allergen, whether that's like a pollen or whether it's a kind of food they've eaten, but they won't have any lacrimation and they shouldn't have any discharge either. It's just red and swollen. Um, viral conjunctivitis, on the other hand, is red and it's, it's much more kind of watery. The discharge is very clear and watery. Um, it tends to be either like an adenovirus um, or a herpes. Obviously herpes, it tends to be a worse kind of, a more severe clinical picture than an adenovirus um, and it can last kind of eight or nine weeks. And then we've got a bacterial conjunctivitis, which is red, dry, so no lacrimation. And you get this really horrible micropurent, um, mucopurent discharge rather, which is like a green, yellow discharge all around the eyes. It can crust the eyes together and they can get stuck, particularly at night. So they sleep, their eyes are closed, and then they wake up and they have to like pry their eyelids open. It's very nice. Okay, so conjunctivitis, what about episcleritis versus scleritis? Um, so someone just asked, how can it be dry, going back to the bacterial um, conjunctivitis, how can it be dry and also have discharge? So dry in terms of, it's not producing those watery tears, but the discharge is quite thick and gloopy. It's not like a, um, it's quite, how do I describe this? Yeah, it's, it's quite thick. 
um, and sticky. I don't know if you've ever seen someone with bacterial conjunctivitis and it's kind of more on the periphery rather than like teary within the actual conjunctiva, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Does anyone want to explain a little bit about episcleritis versus scleritis? If you have to give like a explanation or a comparison between the two at all? Yeah, perfect. Scleritis is the entire sclera. Wow, look at this. You guys should honestly be doing this lecture. Yeah. So, um, scleritis is the entire sclera compared to episcleritis, which is just the episclera. So, the bit in between the conjunctiva and the sclera um, is the episclera, and it's just that bit that's in, inflamed in episcleritis. Um, Episcleritis is more painful, so that's a difficult one. Episcleritis can actually often be less painful than scleritis, um, partly just because there's less, um, what's the word? There's less, less of the eyes affected, I guess. So if we look at here compared to here, um, but obviously also pain is subjective, you know. Um, in terms of as well, scleritis, you tend to have like visual disturbance in terms of you have um, reduced visual acuity, that, that general blurring of your vision. Um, and again, it's very painful, particularly when you move your eyes. You also have sometimes like a blue tint to your eyes, which I'll show you a bit more later. Um, and yeah, it just looks, it just looks sore to be honest. Um, so someone said about the fact that if you use a fluorescent dye, you can distinguish between them. Um, that's really, really great. So it can be other types of dye as well, but essentially when you put the dye in, they will, in, scler in scleritis, you have dilation of your conjunctival vessels or the, well, the, the um, scleral vessels. Whereas in episcleritis, when you put the dye in, there's no dilation of the vessels. Um, as a general rule, fluorescein dye or any of those dyes help to visualize the actual vascular structure in the eye. Um, they can do other things too, but just as a general rule, that's what they're there for. Um, what else is there to say? Yeah, episcleritis is often idiopathic, but it could sometimes have a systemic cause. Same with scleritis, but episcleritis is more common. Yeah, I think that's everything to say. I guess being aware that scleritis is a really big emergency, partly because um, you know they've probably got systemic disease causing it, and partly just because they're at quite a significant risk of um, lasting damage to their eyes. So here's the episcleritis again. You've got the just the episclera being affected. If you look, you can still see the white underneath, um, and there's no tinting. Um, he doesn't look that happy still, personally, but never mind. Whereas this is a scleritis, um, so you've got much kind of more redness. It's much more extensive. Or Additionally, you've got this kind of blue tinting in the eye, in the sclera, and essentially what's happened is the sclera has become quite thin, um, and the choroid underneath, which was that like black pigment, has, is showing through more, and that's why you get like a weird tinting of the eye. Cool. Um, I won't go over this, but this is just like a nice summary of uveitis and whatever the other one is, scleritis. So, um, just wanted to kind of hone in again on talk about management and referring because I found for fourth year a lot of what they wanted was they don't necessarily care that much if you can correctly diagnose stuff they're um, much more interested in the way that you approach things so are you safe essentially was the biggest kind of question so understanding when you should refer someone and understanding um, what things are more worrying than others and what kind of safety netting you need to give is really important in fourth year. Um, you usually won't be wrong for saying, if inappropriately saying, okay, well, I would probably want to get them seen. You'll probably piss off somebody in real life if you keep doing it. But in general, they're okay with you saying, I'd want a senior reviewer, I'd want a second opinion. I'm not very sure. Whereas if you very confidently are like, yeah, send them home, they're fine. And then it's actually like a really serious condition. They're gonna be much more worried about um, maybe like false confidence, which I think is unusual because normally I'd say be confident, back yourself always. In this situation, it's okay to say, I'm not very sure, um, I would probably want to escalate or I'd want to refer them for further, for specialist input. 
Okay, um, I just saw a question. Does anyone, does anything predispose patients to scleritis? Yeah, so great question. Um, as always, you can get away with like, like smoking, the big one, um, and then your systemic disease again can cause scleritis. So I don't think it's as specific as your um, HLA mediated, um, but it's definitely, um, but systemic disease is definitely implicated. I think in particular some types of vasculitis, um, so like granulomatosis with polyandritis, I think is linked in scleritis. Um, whereas episcleritis, correct me if I'm wrong, is more of a, um, I think like Crohn's and UC and things like that, you can get kind of mild episcleritis with. But yeah, feel free to call me out if I'm wrong. Okay, um, I will check that actually. That's, that's a good, I'll put it on my list. Yeah, if there's anything that I've not covered today that you want me to cover, just send me a private message and I'll have a um, look through my notes and see if there's anything I've just missed out today. Okay, um, what about ulcers? Because this is something I don't think was covered that well in the lectures that we had about ophthalmology, but actually came up and I think more than I was expecting. Um, and it's a really serious condition that you don't want to miss. So corneal ulcers, as a general rule, anything that um, involves a cornea is a, a keratitis or kera, kera is the kind of prefix I really should learn more words so keratitis means inflammation of the cornea and ulcerative means it's causing an ulceration and if we look at these pictures here it's that grey white kind of area in the actual cornea at the front bit here so the rest of it is translucent and then you've got this white area um, does anyone know, well actually, so this is the hyperpion that we talked about, so this is the actual pus level in the, in the eye, you can see it here, um, and it's a sterile pus, so it's not an infectious one, even though this probably, it quite easily could be an infectious picture, but the pus is caused by the toxins produced by bacteria, rather than the actual bacteria causing the pus itself. Okay, so they present obviously, what, apart from the hyperpion, what other things might they have? in an ulcerative picture. Yeah, definitely reduced visual acuity. Pain, yeah, definitely pain. Blind spot, smashing it, well done. So, pain, visual acuity, blind spot. Um, when it's pain, where, where would the pain be? So is in is it in a very distinct place? Is it all over <laughs> in the eye? Yeah, yeah, that's fair. Can't argue with that. Yeah, so the whole whole eye, so it's um orbital. Sometimes you might even get a little bit of um periorbital kind of pain as well, like a referred pain. Um and it's and it's pain underlined in bold with an exclamation mark. Um again, these people who are wincing, they're groaning, they might be shouting. It's not, it's not a comfortable condition at all. And with good reason, because it's very serious. So, okay, who are the people who are prone to get corneal ulcers? Is there like any group that you'd be? Yeah, contact lenses, big time contact lenses. So contact lenses obviously are great. They've revolutionized being able to see, it's mind blowing, but at the same time, um, particularly contact lenses that you wear, so like monthly contact lenses, um, reusable is the word, um, they can cause quite a lot of dryness in your eye and tears are really great lubricant and they also provide some kind of pathogenic cover. So if you reduce that, um, the lubrication from the tears, which contact lenses do, then you are um, increasing your risk of getting an ulcer. On top of that, if you get any kind of pathogen there, then you're introducing a foreign body in the form of your contact lens, um, which could one, transmit the infection and two, just irritate it. And that irritation can cause an ulcer. Um, other things as well that you'd want to be worrying about for um, people who get ulcers. So dry eye, similar thing with the contact lens, but just anyone who has dry eye conditions. So Shrogan's, Bell's palsy, if you think they have difficulty closing their eye um, and they often need artificial tears, so they can get an ulcer if it lasts long enough to, and it's not treated with the artificial tears. 
Okay. So can someone tell me what this is? Does anyone know? This is I would have no idea. So don't worry if you're sat in any of this today, like what is going on? Um, this is a dendritic kind of, wow, there we are. So yeah, it's a dendritic ulcer. So we have kind of lots of different types of corneal ulcer. It could be bacterial, could be viral, it could be fungal, it could be, um, what's the word? Protozoic, protozoal, protozoal. Um, bacterial ones are your classics, if ever in doubt, staph and strep will get you through. Viral can be um, herpes, it can be, so herpes simplex, or it could be um, herpes zoster, like varicella, and it could be um, fungal, like aspergillus, and then it could be the protozoa. And obviously they all present slightly differently. Um, well, they all present kind of similarly, but obviously when you swab them, you'll find a different cause and that will kind of determine your management plan. But in particular, HSV, um, so herpes simplex produces this really characteristic dendritic ulcer. So what they've done is they've put in these eye drops, the fluorescein, and it's this kind of um, yellow, orange tinted um, dye. When you put it in and you shine like an ultraviolet light like that, you can basically see um, the dendritic ulcer. And it, it pretty much looks like that. Um, so in terms of treatment, corneal ulcers are a really, really quite dangerous condition because you're eventually just if you think about it you are just eroding the eye um so whilst they're with that erosion obviously they're going to be presenting with that pain the blind spot the reduced visual acuity the reduced vision like color vision um and if you don't kind of deal with the problem that will progress and could actually cause like long-term vision problems so you're going to hit this condition really really hard and aggressively so if you've got a bacterial picture you're going to be giving antibiotics pretty much every hour on the hour um, for, for quite a while. Um, if you're presenting with viral, again, you need acyclovir five times a day minimum. If you're getting um, fungal or protozoal, that gets more complicated, particularly protozoal. That's like the big bad. Um, and that's really unfortunate. They're the people who wear your contact lenses in the shower, get some weird protozoal infection, and then you lose your eye. Um, okay, any questions about ulcers? Is it always topical? Um, so you probably wouldn't give them anything like IV, um, but um, yeah, pretty much always topical. Um, if you think as well, so you would just, you'd probably be better just increasing the strength of the ointment that you give. Um, and they tend to use ointments rather than drops because they tend to be they tend to work better. Um, so they tend they would just increase the the dose of the percentage. So giving like three percent acyclovir um, rather than like two point five or whatever. Um, and yeah, again, it has to be refrigerated. So I have personal experience with this. Sadly, I got a corneal ulcer once. It was awful. I had to um, wake up every hour, including at night, um, on the hour and put these eye drops in, well this eye ointment in, and it was, and it had to be refrigerated, which was fun for lectures. So yeah, I'm pretty sure it always has to be topical, but again, I can double check that. It's on the list. Cool. So, vitreous detachment next. Um, what, what's our understanding of vitreous detachment? Did you have any, have you had any ophthalmology lectures this year, apart from the CBL? No. Okay. Because yeah, I thought the CBL, the actual like PowerPoint was quite, was not bad. I thought it was quite good. But for me personally, the actual CBL that I had, and it might've been different to yours, was okay. It, it had, had quite cases in, you know, but I don't think it covered enough of the new stuff or the things that maybe are a bit more difficult to grasp, like vitreous detachment. So I put posterior in brackets just because that's the most common type. Um, you obviously can get vitreous detachment anywhere. What it essentially means, if I go onto the next slide, is if we look here, this is all the vitreous humour. Go for this one actually, this is all the vitreous humour. And along the wall near the end here is just come away from the retina. And 
this is a bit of a spectrum of a condition. So they're going to get kind of a painless um, visual kind of, they get like a painless vision loss um, and an appearance. So with that vision loss, it's, well, it's a vision change. They get floaters, as you can see here, and they're kind of like cobwebs. Um, that is the way they're described, but like black floating things. Um, floaters essentially occur because in your vitreous humour, there's these deposits um, and they move through the vitreous humour and your eyes, so when the light's shining through, it kind of has to kind of account for the fact that there is this like deposit in the vitreous humour, if that makes sense. It's a bit of a weird thing to kind of get your head around, um, but that's why I didn't realise that a floater actually floats, like it moves around, um, and that's why. It's because it's moving around in the vitreous humour. So here we are. You've also got something called a vice, vice spring. Um, essentially, this when the actual um, vitreous humour like detaches, at the back in the posterior bit um it on the actual fundoscopy it can be visualized as it folds in and makes a circle and that's that ring here um which i'm not sure if it's weiss or vice but i don't think they'll they'll pull you up on that too much um so we've talked about the floaters what other symptoms might they have yeah vision loss yeah um, and often it's a bit of a trick question because they could just be completely asymptomatic. Um, posterior vitreous, vitreous detachment is an interesting one because it can lead to really significant pathology that we'll come on to, but it also in and of itself is, isn't, I'm not saying it's not a big deal, it is because of its risks, but often it could just be asymptomatic and it might be something that you didn't even realise you had. Um, okay, so again, looking at it, there's the vitreous humor this is the vitreous being detached from the retina and as it detaches more and more it's pulling the retina with it so as you can probably guess that has pretty bad consequences for the retina okay before we come on to that though vitreous hemorrhage so what is this even if you just break it down into kind of simple Yes, there we go. Stunning. Yeah, so leaky blood vessels. So vitreous hemorrhage is essentially bleeding into the vitreous humour. So the kind of like three way main ways it can happen. It could either be um, that you have proliferation of, or you have a neovascularization. So the new vessels that are made often in like diabetic retinopathy, for example. And what happens is with that neovascularization, those vessels are immature and they're quite fragile and they leak like Jess said so you just get blood pooling into the the kind of vitreous um, body you can also have things like tumors um so like a retinoblastoma for example they could bleed although obviously they're quite rare and then finally just things like we talked about already the posterior vitreous detachment can quite easily lead to vitreous hemorrhage as well so on the screen here there's not just like my computer screen being dirty. These are some of the kind of floaters that you would see in a hemorrhage. Um, they look like black insects or like string or something, hair. Um, and they kind of move their way across the, your entire visual field. And if you looked at it on fundoscopy, as they've done here, you've got the actual hemorrhage and they've got some abnormal blood vessels, which is the kind of neovascularization. And that's, that's because the most common cause of vitreous hemorrhage is that um, proliferation. Okay, so how are we going to investigate vitreous hemorrhage? Obviously there's a clue because it's a picture of one of the things. Yeah, fundoscopy, perfect. So we need some fundos fundoscopy. Um, anything else? Remember we talked before about that dye that we put in to look at the blood vessels? I don't remember the name of that one. Yeah, fluorescent dye, so the fluorescent, perfect. Um, and also the slit lamp. So again, if you're ever stuck in an ophthalmology question, going back to the whole Afro thing, so doing, you have to do your stellar chart, you've got to do your fields, they're probably not going to help you so much here, but then um, reflexes and then ophthalmoscopy, aka fundoscopy, and then your two special tests. So you can always say slit lamp and get away with it because even if it's not implicated in that pathology, you need to rule out other things. 
And then fluorescent dye, similar kind of thing. You can probably argue your case for ruling something out with it, even if it's not immediately um, relevant. Yeah, and as Jess said, it's the fluorescent angiography. So you put the fluorescent in and you can do some more sensitive tests than just like generally looking with like your ultraviolet light. You can actually do some computerized testing with the angiography. Cool. Um, hopefully this will work. This is a kind of, I don't want to say GIF or GIF or whatever people say, but this is um, just a depiction of the floaters that move through. Again, they look like long black kind of tendrily things moving through and they're not just, they're not um, stationary. I don't know why I thought they were, but yeah. Um, or it could be more severe. So in this case here, they've actually kind of kind of horrifically got this like red clouding across and that would be a very severe case of vitreous hemorrhage and that's the actual blood essentially. Um, there's a really good website which I've put in the resources and it just helps you visualize the kind of visual defect you get for each condition and I think if you could explain why you get that visual defect you can probably you probably understood why it happens and therefore you probably understood the pathophysiology hopefully. Okay um, so this is what we're talking about, the floaters, this is why you get the floaters in terms of the just in the actual vision. So you've got the floaters, which are the deposits in your vitreous humour, and it hinders the passage of light through the eyeball. And this is also just another picture of a vice ring, so um, that we talked about with the posterior detachment, um, because as we said before, that's implicated in um, vitreous haemorrhage, and also is a cause of floaters. What are the deposits? Um, so this is a very question. Um, the, so they're usually like kind of breakdown products of whatever's happened. So with the posterior vitreous detachment, part of the breakdown product will kind of present itself as, will part kind of deposit in the actual like healthy, like jelly-like substance of the vitreous humor. Um, but it could be other things um, in there like blood that will count as a floater because that's a deposit. Um, so yeah, it, it can be it can be lots of different things, but usually it will either be a breakdown product or the blood. Does that make sense? Okay. Right. I don't know what time we're on. Right, we've been about an hour. I don't want to keep you guys for too much longer because I know um, this is this is probably quite a, a long one, but I don't want to rush it. So I'll let me know if this is taking a long time or if you want me to kind of speed up, slow down. Um, could the white thing be anywhere in the fundoscopy image? Um, no, it tends to. It does tend to be kind of in the central zone, um, kind of at the optic disc. And I, I'm really sorry, I couldn't tell you why. Um, probably the way it folds, I guess, if it's in the posterior segment where it folds in, that would be my interpretation, but um, like superimposed onto it. But um, let me know if that, I'll, I'll double check that because that's a very good question. Okay, so no one said that they want me to um, stop now, but I will, again, I'll try and keep an eye on the time for the rest of this. Um, so macular de degeneration, I think, is a um, really important condition. Again, had teaching on it um, in both fourth and third year. So what is it? It's that degeneration of the retina at the macula. So before we spoke about the macula, and it's that area with the really high um, kind of concentration of your cones, which is the, um, the photoreceptors responsible for that high resolution color vis vision that you get in good light. So as you can probably imagine, if there's damage to the macula, you're losing that high resolution color vision and it's in the center. So you're also, it's mostly going to affect the center of your vision. So with that in mind, what kind of symptoms do you think you'll have in macular degeneration? Yep, central vision loss, well done. Yeah, so like a, a progressive picture. So central vision loss, and they call it that kind of central scotoma. Sc sc yeah, scotoma. So scotoma basically means like visual field defect, and it's in the center, um, and it kind of gets bigger and bigger as time progresses. And very classically in um, mac macular degeneration, you get distortion of straight lines, which is known as 
metamorphopsia. Um, and we'll talk about that a bit more in a minute. Um, you also get changes to your colour vision because as we said, you're damaging the macula where you've got that high concentration of cones. So that reduced colour vision, um, get like a tinting again to a yellow, um, more yellow blue kind of tint. Um, so those are kind of like the three big things you'd be worried, looking for. And it's painless because it's over time and it's painless. Often a lot of people won't realise that they've got like a, an actual problem with their eyesight until it's progressed to a point that's difficult to manage. Um, so obviously someone would probably present before they had this, hopefully. Um, but you'd be surprised at the level that people present at. It's not as simple as like one speck um, of like the centre of your vision being obscured and then you like run to the optometrist because most people kind of will put it off or they might not even notice or um, might be worried about it because whilst age related macular degeneration is the most common cause of um visual disturbance in the over 65s uh, in over 65s in the uk it's also maybe not very well understood i think by the general population okay so we talked a bit about this metamorphopsia which is this distortion of the straight lines um, and the central scotoma here so what's happened is if you look at this in fact does anyone know what the name of this this thing here what's it called Yeah, perfect, Amsler. So you get this Amsler grid, which is like a load of straight lines. Um, a is what we would see, hopefully. Um, so normal eyesight, you can see all the straight lines and then the central black dot. Um, in macular degeneration, you have distortion of the straight lines and then you also get the kind of darkening in central scrotoma, so you can't actually see that in the middle bit. Although in this case, you can still kind of see the dot. Um, any questions about that so far? keep going there so there's two types of macular degeneration as you probably already know there's wet and it's dry wet is well we'll start with dry dry is more common about 90 percent of cases and it's gradual um it tends to present over decades really well yeah over decades to be honest like it's, it's a very slow growing picture they present with kind of drusen which is these like white dots on fundoscopy well and and that kind of loss of central vision that's progressive distortion of lines um, and changes to the colour vision. And when I said present, obviously, when you do ophthalmoscopy, you'll notice the drusen. They themselves are probably not gonna know that they've got drusen, hopefully. Um, then we've got the wet macular degeneration, which is um, neovascularization from the choroid um, layer. And you get these new blood, new blood vessels that form and they kind of basically overlie the macula. And cause problems there and they're obviously very leaky as we said before neovascularization is not very um efficient and it leaks causes bleeding and it's not very helpful for the macula it can cover it and also is reducing the blood supply to it so you've got the two types which is worse wet or dry macular degeneration perfect yeah strong well straight in there yeah so wet macular degeneration is worse um which is interesting because it's the only one that has a kind of possible pharmacological treatment for it. Um, but the part of the reasoning is once it gets to think of them as a continuation on a spectrum. So everybody has dry macular degeneration and then some people will progress to wet macular degeneration. So in response to that kind of damage to the macula, they'll produce these new blood vessels and then that will deteriorate further. So they might have had, they might be known to have dry macular degeneration. And then they suddenly present with a more acute picture of increasing um, central vision loss and increasing visual changes. Um, and then when you examine them, you'll find this neovascularization. Okay, anything, any questions about that? Oh, we haven't talked about treatment. I think it's on the next page. So this is just showing again, these are the hard, the drusen, these like yellow spots that you find um, across, um, across the eye. And then we've got, the wet or neovascular macular degeneration and you can see the progression here so the distortion of the lines but also the kind of darkened um, central spot which is the scotoma um, and that actually corresponds to here his face has been distorted and you actually even can't even see the face because of the dark lines so we won't talk about this because we've kind of gone over that but i'll leave it there so when you guys have the slides you can read through it um, in terms of treatment though 
as you said, wet macular degeneration is the only one that has some form of pharmacological treatment. So you can give anti-VGEF, so VGEF standing for vascular growth endothelial factors. Um, and these are injections that you give um, every month for three to six months um, of a MAB, essentially, like um, a monoclonal, mon oh my gosh, monoclonal antibody. Wow. Um, and what that does is it tries to stop angiogenesis, so stop those new vessels forming. If it works, it works okay. If it doesn't work, um, there's sadly not much more you can do beyond modify your lifestyle risk factors. So eating well, um, lots of antioxidants, lots of leafy green veg, stopping smoking because that's a particular risk factor for macular degeneration as it is with every condition ever. And um, obviously things like family history, you can't modify, but you can go for regular checkups to prevent your dry macular degeneration progressing. Okay, moving on, we're nearly there now. So retinal detachment um, is bad news. It's a detachment of the inner layer of the retina, which is the bit that contains those photoreceptor cells. Um, and as we said before, this is often as a result of that posterior vitreous detachment. So as the vitreous humor kind of detaches from the retinal wall, it can pull the retina with it and that retinal layer. Um, and they get this really characteristic picture. So does anyone know that the characteristic kind of um, description of the vision change? Yeah, perfect. So it's a curtain over your eyes. So it'll be sudden, kind of painless. They'll just feel like a, a dark curtain descending across their eye or across half their eye. Um, when you then examine that eye, um, you'll, with fundoscopy, you'll find kind of a, a clear demarcation like this. Um, and if you see this kind of greeny area, this is the detachment. And this red is a bit of a tear as well. Um, so we're talking about the tears. There's, there's kind of two main sub, subsections of retinal detachment. You could have retinal detachment because of that posterior vitreous detachment. And it, as it pulls, the, as the vitreous humor pulls, it tears the retina and it's pulling it across. Or you could have something called traction retinal detachment, which is where you get kind of like firm bands forming in the vitreous humor. And as your eye moves, this, this band kind of causes, well, the traction of the band pulls the retina with it. Um, you can also kind of get some like rare systemic causes like sickle cell and, and um, some kind of like rare infectious diseases. But for the sake of not overcomplicating things, it can either get pulled or it can be in posterior vitreous detachment and it's much more common to be posterior vitreous detachment. Um, so because of that the symptoms of posterior vitreous detachment are really important to consider. If someone comes in with like, flashes and floaters, it's, whilst it is likely that it could just be some of the, I'm going to stop calling it PVD now, sorry, PVD, um, the retinal detachment is something you can't rule out um, just by like, taking the history alone. So if someone said to you, um, I've got these new flashes or I've suddenly had quite a lot of flashes and floaters in my vision, they need immediate, immediate assessment um, by an ophthalmologist because you need to rule out retinal detachment. And the thought process behind that is, if they can be seen and the detachment can be corrected within about 12 hours, there is a good chance that they'll have some level of kind of functional vision Unfortunately, retinal detachment causes significant ischemia um, and if the photoreceptor cells and also then the nerves um, become ischemic, then they won't recover and you can get kind of like lasting blindness. So again, they might have a prodrome of that flashes and floaters and then suddenly a curtain descending across the eyes and then um, that, would be, that would be kind of a, a sign of something dangerous. Okay, any questions about that? So, again, here's that kind of line, the demarcation between them, and that's where the retina is detached. And they've got this kind of curtain view with some flashes and some floaters. Well, these are just floaters. Um, in terms of, is this another thingy? Okay, sorry, I like a gif. Okay and that's just coming down across their vision like a black curtain. In terms of treatment for it, so again, you want to do some surgery. 
if it's small enough, you could maybe get away with just doing laser. Um, but for the sake of our understanding for like finals level, it would be if it's small, do laser. If it's big, you're going to need to do some form of surgery to repair the damage. Okay. And again, this is a little diagram. So when you go over this, you can have a look at it. I've highlighted just like the key words. Please do not learn this table. It's so long. And if they asked it to this level, I'd be shook. Um, okay. And again, this is the surgery we talked about. So you're just going to put a surgery. So you're going to make like a little buckle around the eye and hopefully it will kind of compress it and bring the retina back, the, the torn bit of the retina back towards the actual like layer that it's been torn from um, and heal. So retinal artery occlusion, the buzzwords, we're going to kind of speed it up now because I don't want to keep you too much longer. Buzzwords, retinal artery occlusion, you've got a cherry red spot and essentially what happens here is you have occlusion of the retinal artery and its branches usually because of some type of thromboembolic event and that causes the actual retina that's been supplied by those arteries to die or to become ischemic so you get a pale retina and this cherry red spot which is this bit here that is normally supplied by the choroid um, artery so this bit is actually not affected by the occlusion and the ischemia and that's why it appears red against the pale backdrop of the retina then we have what else they say about it so yeah it's it's an emergency um, as you can probably guess um, in terms of symptoms that it presents with, um, it's painless, but it's a sudden kind of visual change. Um, they might have a kind of clear arteriopath history, so like atherosclerosis, particularly carotid artery atherosclerosis. They might have suffered with amaurosis fugax. fugax. Does anyone know what that is or want to explain that? That's a very long word as well. I'll, I'll um, just for the interest of time, I'll explain it. Yeah, it's a sudden loss of thank you, Katie. It's a sudden loss of vision in one eye, um, and it's transient, so it lasts kind of like one to five minutes, and then they don't have another episode for like a couple of weeks or a week or two, um, and then it's a really bad sign. It's usually a sign they're going to have a stroke or some form of thromboembolic event in the near future. So if someone comes into the GP and says, oh, I've just had a loss of my vision suddenly, and then it went, they actually need to have um, assessment on the same day. Okay, so we've spoken a bit about cherry red spots and retinal artery occlusion. That's probably as detailed as I would go. Um, then we've got retinal vein occlusion, which is more common. It can be broken down into ischemic and non-ischemic types. So again, as you can probably guess, ischemic types are worse. Um, they have this kind of sudden severe loss of vision in the eye and then when you look at it you get this really interesting blood and thunder pattern so if you look here there's just like flame hemorrhages in all of the quadrants of the eye you have these like white deposits on the retina um, you can see um, kind of like cotton wool spots throughout which is like that edema um, because they have this kind of severe macular edema um, and if you did a, um, if you looked for a relative afferent pupillary defect, which is that time when you swing the light from eye to eye with it covered like this, if you did that, you would notice a re relative afferent pupillary defect as well. Same as in retinal artery, art, ret retinal artery occlusion. Okay, so moving on then, retinitis pigmentosa, really, really briefly, autosomal dominant condition which causes a progressive dysfunction of your retina really rare but really important to consider it causes blindness and this kind of tunnel visioning so the opposite to um, something like macular degeneration where you have your peripheral vision preserved here your central vision is damaged and um, it kind of is going to get worse and worse and it will actually lead to total blindness compared to macular degeneration which rarely does um, it presents in younger children sadly so like five to thirty um, and there's not really much you can do about it which is very sad i think there's not really any treatments for it beyond kind of like therapy like counseling about the fact that you're going to go blind before the age of 30. when you examine the eye you'll notice these kind of like black lines here and they're called bone spicules um, you might also see kind of atrophy of the optic disc, particularly as it progresses. 
Um, and then when you do things like visual fields on them, so perimetry, you'll notice that they have um, quite significantly reduced visual fields as time progresses. Okay, retinoblastoma, again, really briefly, ignore that first line, that was from my cardio exam. So retinoblastoma is a really rare but significant um, type of malignant tumour in the eye and it affects the retina, as you can probably imagine. Um, it affects children and they get that really classic loss of a red reflex. So again, in a question, they'll say something like, that you took a, um, they took a picture of their child and they had one red eye and one non-red eye. And actually the non-red eye, which is um, the leukocoria, as it's known as, is, um, is the affected eye. So that would need an urgent referral within two weeks um, to see a pediatric, pediatric oncologist. The reason I've put two hit hypothesis is this is a really interesting case of genetics. So retinoblastoma is 50-50 hereditary and non-hereditary. If you have a hereditary type, which is autosomal dominant, you, you inherit your kind of affected um, allele, and that means that the increased risk of cancer will be expressed in your body. But then you only need to get one more mutation to develop the cancer. Whereas if it's non-hereditary, you need to get two mutations, and they're quite rare mutations. So in theory, it's that two-hit hypothesis and the fact that you become more likely to be exposed, you're more likely to be um, to express retinoblastoma if you have that genetic link, which I think makes sense. And, and I think it's kind of common sense. But there we are. Okay, glaucoma, last thing. And then there's a Kahoot quiz. If you guys want to do it, then I'm, I'm down to do it, but don't feel pressured to. Um, glaucoma can be open and closed angle. Glaucoma, again, really important. You've had teaching on it in third year and fourth year. And I don't know whether this is expressed enough, but glaucoma actually isn't um, a disease of increased intraocular pressure. It's a disease where you have increased um, cupping of the optic disc. And I'll explain that a bit more in a minute. So increased cupping of the optic disc and it's then presents with that kind of retinal ganglial cell loss. Um, it just so happens that the most common cause is usually raised intraocular pressure. Inter intraocular pressure. So, with cupping here, here's a normal kind of cell. You normally should have some cupping. This cup here is this kind of pale disc, the pale aspect to the disc, um, and it has no nerves in. Oh, hello, I'm frozen. Whereas this one here is um, red and it contains lots of nerves. When in glaucoma, the nerves become ischemic, um, usually due to compression from raised pressure. Those ischemic nerves then die, and so you get more of this kind of pale cup. So the cup to disc ratio increases and that's why when you look at the eye you should see that kind of more than half of the whole circle should be the actual cup which is that paler area so does anyone know what, the, what this is here these these pictures it's the same thing just one's a bit more high tech so I don't know if I was going to say it. I, I wouldn't have known either. This is something called tonometry. So essentially tonometry, you're looking at the pressure in the eye. And I think it's really important to remember that. So tonometry looks at pressure. And what they do is they essentially compress the cornea and see how much force it takes to like flatten the cornea. Um, the more force it takes, the more like the higher the pressure. Um, and they use that to kind of work out, yeah, if the raised pressure could be causing this kind of ischemia in the retinal ganglion cells so 10 to 21 millimeters is usually um, an acceptable amount of pressure millimeters of mercury is the normal kind of range for pressure in the eye anything more than that and you're worrying about glaucoma so very quickly a little bit on how that happens normally it, um, aqueous humor produces it from the ciliary body is produced by the ciliary body and it kind of flows out from the posterior chamber chamber around the lens and the iris and then it goes in and is drained into um, the trabecular meshwork and then finally into the sh um, canal schlem which is at the areto corneal angle which is right here if you have something in glaucoma this kind of passage is blocked so here the angle between the um, cornea and the, um, the lens and the iris is blocked so you get a buildup of pressure here in the posterior chamber which pushes onto the anterior chamber and prevents the canal of Schlem, of Schlem from draining all that fluid. So it kind of, 
this backlog here is causing a, a backlog there and that's the bit that you're worried about the lack of drainage so if you have reduced outflow of that aqueous humor it's just going to start pushing down and causing more fluid here in the aqueous in the anterior chamber and that's going to cause a kind of global increased intraocular pressure which is going to have an outward force on the eye and here's the optic nerve it's going to press on the optic nerve and compress it and by compressing it you're causing ischemia okay that was a very brief explanation of glaucoma but um i can explain it some more later if you need me to does anyone have any questions this is the last bit i promise and then i will let you guys kind of enjoy your evening okay so open angle is a kind of chronic um, picture. They have um, progressive symptoms. And again, usually they won't even realize they've got the symptoms until you kind of get to the like late, early and advanced glaucoma stages. Um, and they get that loss of the peripheral visual fields, um, but the central vision is retained or preserved. And on fundoscopy here, this is the cup and the, this is the, the disc. That's the cup, and it's way over half of, well over half of the total diameter. Then we have closed angle glaucoma. So ignoring that again, that's sorry, that's from the cardio thingy. We have this. Um, well, can someone describe that picture for me? What they think the picture is showing? Yeah, perfect. Mid dilated pupil. So, what about what's this arrow pointing to here? So it's basically just like a red, um, a red eye. So they have this kind of hard red eye. It's very tense because of the pressure. They've got that mid dilated pupil that Eve just mentioned. And then you get this hazy cornea as well. So the hazy kind of like, um, it, it looks kind of blurred and that's because of edema and that kind of increased fluid um, at the anterior chamber. So we use a thing called gonioscopy, which is something you use to visualize the anterior chamber. You can see the angle between it. We can also do um, tonometry to look at the pressure again over 21 is considered high and then we do things like fundoscopy to look at the cup to disc ratio um, again i won't go through this now because it's pretty much what we've just been saying um, being aware that again closed angle glaucoma is an acute presentation it's red hard really painful eye and they often have systemic effects with it too so headaches vomiting and nausea um, and they have as, as it's an emergency um, you need to get them seen by an ophthalmologist immediately because they're at quite a severe risk of damage, lasting damage to their vision. So this is a table of the treatments for um, glaucoma, which is something I always struggled to remember, but I think you just need to go away and learn it. Um, I've highlighted all the bits that I think are the bits to actually focus on. Please don't learn like all of this table. It's a bit ridiculous. Um, so just thinking about the fact that in the actual, if we go back to the Canal of Schlem here, um, we want to either increase um, outflow or we want to reduce the production. So often they start with something like this, which is the tanoprost. It's a prostaglandin inhibitor um, and it basically increases the, um, the flow through um, of the aqueous flow um, and hopefully would reduce that pressure. Then we could use things like a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor, which blocks the ciliary muscle from producing any more aqueous humor so things like acetazolamide which is a diuretic um, and then also these all these other wonderful things like timolol um, which is a beta blocker again it reduces the um, aqueous um, humor production um, I think those are the things to focus on in it I wouldn't get too bogged down in learning all the adverse effects and knowing that you know you've got conjunctival vasoconstriction um, what was the other one I said to, to be aware of? Again, yeah, knowing that pilocarpine you can use, it's parasympathetic. So if you think about the fact that um, parasympathetic, your eye, um, well, your, your pupil becomes bigger. So the M3 receptors, which are the muscarinic ones, if you act on them with pilocarpine, it will actually cause the muscle to contract and reduce the angle at the posterior chamber. So increase the angle at the posterior chamber with the pupil and the lens so more can get through.
and that will increase the outflow more. Okay, um, this is just a nice summary for everybody. Do not learn cytomegalovirus retinitis, please, please. Um, you have so many other things you could be doing in the time. And then Kahoot, okay, how do people feel? Do they wanna do a Kahoot? I don't mind if people are kind of tired, you've had like a long day, but if people wanna do it, feel free to do it. We can, I'm very easy. You can send me a private message. I promise I won't be offended if you, either way. Okay. No one said anything that's like thingy. So we'll we'll do it. So the so the number is um, nine hundred eight five nine. I'm just gonna quickly get the thing up yeah feel free to, to to leave if you if you don't want to do it i really won't be offended i promise okay i'm going to share my screen let me see this okay I don't know, have I, have I done the Kahoot thing wrong? I potentially have. Can, can everyone like see it? It doesn't recognize the game pin, interesting. Okay, I'm, I'm not gonna lie, I'm very bad at technology. So I'm gonna just quickly see if I can fix that. Or I can, what I'll do is, Pin doesn't work. Okay, I'm just going to stop sharing for two seconds. If I can't get it to work, don't worry, I won't. I won't labour it. Um, let's see if that helps. Um, okay, so I've remade the quiz. Well, you can hear the awful noise. Okay, so I'll put the new pin in the group. Um, okay, there's the new pin. I like the duck. Yes, this is me. That's my Instagram name, please. Yeah, get a bit of promo. Oh, I'm not screen shared, sorry. Let me do that now. Okay, so we'll start then. So wait, one more second. Okay, we're gonna start. So, question one of the questions. There are 10, I think, in total. What features on fundoscopy would suggest a diagnosis of dry macular degeneration? Oh gosh, I'm gonna end this music, sorry. How do I, oh, ooh. So yeah, so pretty much everyone got that then. So drusen, um, so those are the kind of those white dots that you normally see um, in macular degeneration, kind of widespread in the in the retina. Um, so someone said neovascularization. So that is a very good answer because that's what you'd expect to find in wet macular degeneration, that kind of neovascularization in the choroid um, of the choroid layer. But um, in this case, dry should be drusen. So just think D and D. Okay. Next question, tonometry. What is tonometry used for? This is so annoying. I'm really sorry. <laughs> okay, so measuring interocular pressure. Well done, everyone got that. Um, and again, we like compress, they like flatten the cornea and see if it, um, how much pressure is needed to flatten it. And that kind of corresponds to the intraocular pressure. Cool. Next bit. True or false? Retinal vein occlusion carries a worse prognosis than retinal artery occlusion. So this 
is a difficult one, I think. Um, the answer is false. Um, retinal vein occlusion is, um, obviously you can have your ischemic and your non-ischemic, and whilst ischemic vein, retinal vein occlusion is bad news, retinal artery occlusion, in terms of the long, um, long-lasting effects and the, the risk of vision loss, um, it's more significant in retinal artery. It's almost referred to as a retinal stroke, um, retinal artery occlusion. Okay, next one. Well done, Sophie, smashing the game. Um, number four, what condition would you expect to find this defect in? Okay, so that was a difficult one. If I show you the picture again, here there's like this generalized blurring of the, the, the um, entire kind of vision the entire field um, and that's what we find in cataracts if we look at the other ones glaucoma you're expecting um, I guess you would have blurred vision you know what okay fair enough person you said glaucoma fair enough but um, the picture we used for was in cataracts sorry everyone and then keratitis again mm. next question um, so I can see why people thought those. I guess normally in an exam you'd get a clinical history with it, so that was kind of unfair of me. I should have given you more of a background to it. Okay, halfway there. Metamorphopsia refers to. The distortion of straight lines, as we said before, um, really common in macular degeneration. Um, the kind of damage to your um, your central vision and that those like um, high resolution color vision, um, those that impacts on your ability to perceive things like straight lines and perceive the image clearly. So that's why you get this distortion. Flashes and floaters um, aren't technically a thing in macular degeneration. That is more common in things that affect the vitreous itself. Okay, next one. What condition would present with this orthondoscopy? Is there a way that I can mute it? Okay, I'm just going to mute myself and hope that helps. Okay, so central retinal artery occlusion. Um, if we go back to the picture, you've got that um, characteristic cherry red spot and the pale retina, which is kind of like the things you should be looking for. Um, Amorosis pseudax is the transient loss of vision. Macular degeneration, that's where you're looking for neovascularization. And central retinal vein occlusion, it's more um, peripheral. I'll see if I can find a picture of it in a second. I don't forget. Okay, next one. So, what feature on examination prompts immediate referral to ophthalmology? I think this is the last one, and then we just have some cases. So, what feature of those would you expect to see? Okay, corneal ulceration. Well done, guys. So again, um, looking through those, photophobia um, could be caused by lots of things, but it could be a serious sign of things like meningitis, but alone it wouldn't be enough for immediate referral because you can get it in things like migraines. Purulent discharge, not great obviously to have, but um, think about conjunctivitis, it's quite a common condition that presents with purulent discharge, and that in itself wouldn't necessarily require immediate kind of observation by the ophthalmologist. Progressive decline in vision, that tends to suggest like a more long-term picture. And then finally, corneal ulceration. Um, so that would be the kind of really severe acute pain. You're actually eroding your cornea. So there are quite significant risk of, um, of damage to the eye. And then, okay. Eight, this is a case. So it's a 50 year old who has cobwebs and floaters appearing in their right eye without any pain. Okay. 
last few seconds there. So vitreous hemorrhage. Um, so this is a difficult one again. So the the kind of characteristics in this, if we go through it, cataracts, they don't really tend to get the cobwebbing um, and it's not really sudden, it's quite a gradual picture. Acute angle glaucoma, again, it's a, um, it's not really a, um, it's, it's quite, it has the pain and it is a sudden picture, but there, and there's no cobwebbing, but the, and there's also quite a lot of pain with it. And then retinal detachment, you should have um, no pain, but I think the cobwebbing is kind of more characteristic of vitreous hemorrhage. And again, it'd probably give you a picture with it. This was actually a question, if I remember correctly, that we got asked. Um, and actually, I'm not sure if they did give us a picture. It'd be one of those questions where you could probably argue your case for either side, but retinal detachment, again, yeah, it's less of a cobwebbing. It's more like a red, um, the floaters tend to be more red. Um, and I guess you'll see the way they describe retinal detachment because I've taken all of these from exam questions. So next bit. I think this is the second to last question. We're nearly there now. Well done, Jay, whoever you are. Okay, 21 year old um, male complains of a sudden curtain developing over the bottom half of their vision. Right, so this is the more kind of characteristic de depiction of retinal detachment. Again, this was an exam question. Um, so it's a, that kind of sudden curtain, so it's sudden, it's painless, and it's developing over half of their visual field. Um, wet macular degeneration tends to be, whilst it is an acute picture, they're a bit too young for it, they've not mentioned any risk factors, and again, macular degeneration it should be central with peripheral vision preserved, whereas this suggests it's kind of the bottom half, so including the peripheries. Okay, last question, I think. See, James, Jay's on the top four here. Come on now. Could, could he be pipped to the post? And number 10. So 75-year-old male with a gradual painless decline in vision, particularly at night. And it's over a few years. Okay, well done, guys. So cataract again. So looking at this, corneal ulcer, um, which I said that would be painful, very painful, and not over a few years. It would be in the kind of days um, to weeks maximum. And yeah, he would definitely complain of some pain with that. Closed angle glaucoma, again, it's that pain, it's the red eye, should be sudden. And then open angle glaucoma, I mean, it is something that progresses over time, um, but night kind of night worsening your symptoms isn't typical in open angle glaucoma. Um, where it is very characteristic of um, cataracts and just kind of like the non-specific gradual decline in vision like that's not very um, descriptive and they'll kind of try and trick you with that because it's because cataracts are kind of non-specific blurring of your vision cool okay we're done now that was everything i'm going to stop sharing and go back to the thing um, thank you so much for listening i know that was really long especially after a very long day that is pretty much that's a good majority of the stuff that I think you'd be expected to do in, in kind of ophthalmology. Obviously we didn't cover all of this, but they're very minor things, I think, apart from like stroke and pediatrics. Um, so I think if you could go over this PowerPoint and cover it, you'd probably, probably do you well. Um, I'm going to make that document and hopefully that will help too. Um, I'll put the survey in, but I'm going to let you all have a lovely evening now. And thank you for listening. Okay.